of these uh, videos if you would help Don out or he does a great job, you know. Push that subscribe button, the like button, and leave a <laughs> hey. comment. Leave a comment for Gar's sakes. Yeah, I don't say that enough, so I'm glad you did. <laughs> yeah, no, this is this is fabulous stuff here. Yeah, yeah. This is what amazing technology that we've got. You know, 20 years ago, there have been lights all big cameras all. You know, it's done with, a, with my <laughs> cell phone. That's crazy. But uh, that board of inquiry, why didn't you call the captain of the Sykes? He could, he could tell you, or give you some good insight. There. That's why he wrote that book. I highly recommend you read that book. And what is the name of that book? <clears throat> the name of the book, ladies and gentlemen, if I may, the night the fits went down. Captain Dudley Paquette, who was the captain on the Wilford Sykes. That's it. It's it. By the way, just a couple notes on the Wilfred Sykes. Um, 670 feet long, which was not as big as the Fitz. The Fitz was 729. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, but, but at the time the Sykes was built and launched, June 28th, 1949, it was the biggest ship on yeah. the Great Lakes at the time. So yep. that's a parallel with the Fitzgerald. And like the Fitzgerald, the Wilfred Sykes set seasonal haul records early on. Uh, in its career. It was converted to a self unloader in 1975. And its first trip when it was launched was from Lorraine, where it was built by the American Shipbuilding Company in Lorraine, Ohio. Its first trip, ironically, was to Toledo, Ohio, uh, uh, virtually the home of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And as you pointed out earlier, it loaded opposite of the Fitzgerald at Burlington Northern Dock Number 1, and departed just two hours after the Fitzgerald left from the same dock in Superior, Wisconsin. Although the captain, Captain Dudley Paquette of the, uh, of the Wilfred Sykes said, this storm is too much, I'm gonna go hide, uh, which proved to be a really good move, uh, not so much for the mighty Fitz. I, I, I'm not trying to blame McShirley here. He just, it, his whole career was go, 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 go. And even though he even admitted, I hate to be in a bad storm with this boat, but it was a bad storm. But that's why he checked back. He checked back his speed. And, and the captain of the Sykes just said, hey, I've never heard him in 20 years do that, ever. In fact, when they checked Maybe back... Maybe that's he would, why he went and hid, because if... if if Captain McSorley says he's never seen anything like this, maybe I should <laughs> yeah, listen because yeah, he's never yeah. checked back as long as I've known him. Had the Fitz been going at normal speed and not bottom down on Caribou Shoal. Which you definitely and, believe it did. And 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 when Captain Cooper said, hey, we just got hit, you know, let's, I don't know how fast some waves are going, but let's just say for, for 12 miles an hour. But if it's going 16 and a half, almost 70 mile an hour, they would have beat them waves into Whitefish Bay. But he had checked back, and now them waves caught up with him. You've, you've been in the following sea before, you know, sometimes it can be pretty frightening. It lifts your stern like this, you know? Mm -hmm. And But unfortunately, there was, uh, they lost their reserve buoyancy, and there was nothing else left. And that's why they, Arthur M. Anderson survives to this day. Now, that being said, I've got something for you. Uh, I've, I told you before, as a marine surveyor for 30 years, yachts and small craft, right? A guy that I met with a very good friend of mine. He told me I could use his name, Kevin Bosch out of Sandusky. His grandfather was lived in Lorraine and was an avid photographer, okay? But he happened to have one of the few, he had a 35 millimeter single lens reflex. And a buddy of his calls him and says, hey, we're getting ready to launch this ship down here tomorrow. Why don't you come on down? He says, oh yeah, the Arthur M. Anderson. He says, yeah, come on down. I'll get you, get you get a good picture. They go there. And there's so many, like a Fitzgerald, there's so many people, you know, in the stern, right? He gets them around front. And he takes this picture, and I got it, I made a copy made for you, for your maritime collection. Oh, I love that. That's the launch of the Arthur M. First Anderson. time she ever touched Great Lakes water, first time she's ever in the water. Now, uh, that's awesome. One of his cousins got one of those too, and he put it on the internet. There is, you can see it on your. But that every other view is always of the stern here, see, and that's one of the few of the uh, the bow there. They had it colorized, and uh, look at these poor guys there <laughs> standing away. Wait, oh man! I uh, mean, it looks a lot more tame than the launch of the Fitzgerald. Ah, uh, yes. That sent a wave crashing to the other side. One person was so alarmed he had a heart attack and died. And yeah. in fact, some eyewitnesses say of the Fitzgerald that it almost looked like it wanted to leap right back out of the water. Yeah. It was a hard launch as opposed to the Arthur M. Anderson, which looks relatively tame. 
at least for a, a, a Isn't launch that a neat for picture, a ship though? that size. That's a beautiful. That's a neat that picture. That is a beautiful shot. And the first time she ever touched Where water. is that? Loran Shipyard. Where the, the Wilfred Sykes exactly. was launched. Exactly. Forgive me, but that's a garage sale frame. I picked that up for a couple bucks, you That's all right. <laughs> Hey, we can, we can, I had it and can. I spent it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had to show you this. Got to show you this for going further. There was no internet. There was no computers, right? My <laughs> uncle Claude started selling 1939 on the old Howard M. Hanna. They would have competitions. This is a loving cup. Try and read. I don't know if you can read that. It says to Claude Walton, champion coal passer. Claude Walton. Yeah, it's my uncle Claude. He started in 1939. Champion. Coal, Coal passer, passer. Yeah. Great Lakes, 1939. Yeah. Those are two funnels put together with uh, soldered together with some spoons. Uh, other than that line I got from the fence, this is my most prized possession. He had that all these years, and when he was dying, he gave it to me. It's starting to rust pretty What good. was his name? Claude Walton. My Uncle Claude, yeah. yeah. Well, that would have been your dad's brother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's That's cool. One of my, they had, they had time on their hands, but uh, nowadays, of course, with satellite TV, you don't see stuff like that much anymore, you know. That's they, okay. they had a, a tournament to see who could shovel the most coal, and my Uncle Claude uh, obviously won the prize. Huh. Most of them were World War II vets in the 60s and 70s. They'd come out to the house, bring three or four cases of beer. It took 12 hours to unload the fish drill. In the 12 hours, I made or nine guys had them four cases of beer gone. You ain't going to tell no World War II vet that's gone through pure hell and seen his buddies die and everything else. You're going to tell me he can't drink. Well, they'll tie that boat up and and, and it ain't going nowhere. Yeah, yeah. So even to this day... I, I don't it, know what goes on out there now. But well, I think they condone a, a little bit of it. Yeah, back back in my day, it was pretty much anything goes. Yeah, mine and too. From, you know, but be, now you got to if it was against the company policy, which I'm certain it was, everybody looked the other way. Well... You that's know, the way it was. Well, that's a rough life out there, you know. I mean, it it was for me. That's why. I mean, I lasted about twelve years, and I just couldn't do anymore. I was done. I, I'm glad I did it, but I wouldn't want to do it again. It well, and I did it right out of high school too. I mean, I was 18 years old and bouncing across Lake Michigan in that's the middle, what I did. Of, middle of February, you know, and yeah. on the tug, thinking, "My God, what am I doing here?" Did they have the draft going on when you got out of school? I just missed the draft, the yeah. Vietnam draft, because mm -hmm. you know Saigon fell in, in 1975, and hence the draft was over. So I was getting close. Yeah. I was getting close, but uh, fortunately, I, I did miss that draft. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I was right in the middle of it, but I just enlisted because it was common anyway. As a ham radio operator, I liked electronics, you know, and. They accepted me in their course, and uh, and so I got into radar and all that, and understood all that, you know. And now they've got electronics. Is just well, they got satellites out. They, you know what I'm saying? There's, they know what's going on anywhere in the world. You know, you know we, we've said a lot about Ernest McSorley, the captain. He was a very intelligent, brave, bold man. You can't be anything but to sail on the Great Lakes as a master, a Great Lakes master. It's a very, very difficult job, and I admire everybody that ever did it or even tried to do it. Uh, he had served more than 40 years on the lakes. Um, and as master, this was his final run. This was his last trip. He was going to retire at the end of the 1975 season. It was November 10th. It's the end of the season. This is without question the last run of the season. All he had to do was steer that boat from Superior, Wisconsin home to Detroit. And he one more trip after all that service and he just didn't get there. That, that, that to me still blows my mind and I have a hard time processing that. They, that's awful early to lay a boat up. I mean, my old man would be gone from March to Christmas. Sometimes he didn't make it home for Christmas. So here's yeah, November the 10th. was scheduled to go to dry dock. But she needed work, a lot of freaking lot work, of work, okay? Now I've heard from people that worked on her that they had the, uh, the radars that went out, it was a Sperry Mark III and a Sperry Mark VI. They've been having trouble with them radars all summer. It just is so many weird things had to have happened to have this tragedy happen. And that's why you and our and our brother Tom try to keep it alive so it does not happen again. I mean the the, the sure the, the Evan Fitzgerald is the Titanic of the Great Lakes. That it is. I mean, yes, made eternally famous and legendary by the lyrics from Gordon Lightfoot. 
Uh, but it's a story that captures people over and over and over again every year. This time of year, I start thinking about the Edmund Fitzgerald. And I also know there are more than 8,000 ships laying on the bottom of the Great Lakes, you know, so they're not the only ones. And I know the Fitzgerald gets a lot of attention, but I think it, it, it highlights the, the, the adventure and ultimate danger that these guys are up against out on the Great Lakes. Uh, but the story of the Fitzgerald really hits home for me. 8,000, you say. But well, most of boats, those had... Boats. Yeah, but most of them had loss of life, too. Almost almost a majority of, of them. I mean, it's hard to survive a shipwreck on the oh, Great yeah. Lakes, you know? Not too many Dennis Hales out there. But, I mean, the Fitzgerald was in Toledo uh, in the off-season. It was here so much that it was nicknamed the Toledo Express, among many nicknames, the Mighty Fitz, uh, Queen of the Great Lakes. I and mean, it had all those Toledo connections. Captain McSorley lived in Toledo. I drive by his house all the time. And I pause and I just sit there and I look, you know. And uh, the, the story of the Fitzgerald being from Toledo as I am and some of the crew some of the crew members, many of them lived in this area, it just really hits home for me every year. Well, uh, Toledo was her home port. Yeah. That's right. And yeah, a lot of the crew was, was from the area, you know. And, but Including it, your uncle. Yeah. Well, see, here's it. We're all from Sycamore, Ohio, see? Okay. Close but they enough. got him listed as Fremont, Ohio. Well, that was just a mailing address, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's from Sycamore, and uh, Eddie Benden lived there in Oregon. And uh, Haskell, where was he? They're all from right, right in the Ameri And the old man sat with them all for years. That's why I just, he just, boy, that winter, he just would sit there and have him a case of beer, and, and he wouldn't talk to nobody. And yeah, he, your, your he starts shaking never. his head no, because his, in his mind, he's going, I should have said something. We should have did something different here, you know? Because he knew the Fitzgerald needed needed serious attention. And a lot of other people knew that, too. You know, and little by little, they're coming out. That's why it's so important. If we can find some of these people, God, he said it'd be good. That that uh, that name I got, Richard Orville, he was a second mate. There's got to be other people out there. Oh, there's people out there that worked on the Fitzgerald yeah. that are still here. Well, they've got to have stories. I uh, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, when I went to the 40th Candlelight Vigil for the 40th anniversary, there were some original crew. Your brother was there yeah. who yeah. served on the Fitzgerald. But there were some original crew members there. I'd like to, again, I want to put it out there one more time, I'd like to find someone that was on the Anderson that night, November 9 and 10, mm. 1975, uh, if there's still anyone left, I would... There you go, folks. You heard the main man here. Here's the Fitzgerald. The the lifeboats are useless. You, gotta, you, you, you can't... Every captain out there says these are useless. You can't launch these things. Well, don't you think... How about we change the design here somehow then? The year is 2023, last time I looked, you know, a couple months away or 2024. Hey, change something here. You know, we haven't had a shipwreck since then. I mean, not, um, we've had some fires. We've lost some... so uh, many of them old ships that were still as they were built, say, like the Wilfred Sykes uh, launched in 1941. She's still out there sailing. It's still out there. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Now, I, I called Whitefish Point, and I, I, I reserve a spot for the 50th uh, 50th bell ringing there because the no wall is The 50th anniversary ever, bell ringing. Yeah, I want to get, I'll put my name on it, ring that bell. Because if they don't have family, they give it to somebody else, you know. He says, you got it. He says, if you can make it up here this year, you can do it this year, too. Do they um, actually, I know the original bell that they took from the Fitzgerald mm -hmm. is up at, in the museum at Whitefish Point. That's the ring is that, that's is that the bell they yep. ring? It's in this big plastic wow. case. That, that would be powerful to be there for They're going to take the that. plastic case off, and for each person, they're going to ring it one time. I'm going to sneak up there. I'm going to ring it again for my dad. Ooh, he never got over the, the no. sinking of the Fitzgerald. It affected the whole family. It affected my mother. When he passed away, she never ate again. You know what? She'd have a cup of tea in the morning and a cookie. And she wasted away to nothing, man, you know? So it affected a whole lot of people. And obviously and still does your family, thing. you know? I mean, there were, you know, 29 men on there. That's right. That's right. But uh, when they went against Fred Shannon, and I met him, what a sincere individual. Like I said, he gave me that hat, you know? And, and he has proof that the wreck is actually farther apart than what they say it is. But he, he had outstanding, and there's hours, I mean, there's like, I don't know, 45, 50 hours. Where are they? I'd like to see them. I really would. Because the video that he put out is what, 45 minutes, 50 minutes? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I appreciate it. I think we got good chemistry. You yeah, know? yeah. I try to bring facts, and you you got questions this, and I'm just, because I think a lot of the people have the same questions that you're asking, and uh, that's what a good interviewer does, is uh, 
is try to answer questions, not whitewash. There's too much stuff whitewash, you know. You got this agenda, don't you dare tell the truth over here, see. Now, they should have never uh, screwed over Fred Shannon the way they did. You know, oh, he saw the body. Well, what the heck? You know what he said, Fred Shannon said? He says, you get close to the fence. He says, it's like the souls are, the spirituality is like, they don't want you there, okay? But as they get closer and closer and closer, it says, he said, it's like they accepted them, you know? It's like, yeah, film this, you know? Tell people what happened, you know? But at first, that's the vibes he got until he got into it. And I think they realized then that he was just, because them souls are there, buddy. You know what I mean? I mean, I mean, the Bible says <laughs> to be absent from the body is, is to be with the Lord, but the bodies are there. Can you imagine how terrifying it would be to have been on the Fitzgerald? You're, you're, no one's on deck. He wouldn't allow anyone on deck. You're, you're locked up in your watertight compartment. I mean, you dog down all the doors, yeah. so no water can get in. But when you look off the round porthole and you know you're underwater and it's pitch dark as it was that night, not only on the surface, but certainly in the water, how terrifying that would have been. Them doors ain't watertight in the staterooms. Not in the boats I was on, there was a crack, you know, they're, they're, so, so as they okay, was going well, down, they, the water would... It was coming in. Then. It was definitely coming in, and and the pressure, now think about that. We, we cannot choose how we go. Well, we'd love to go to sleep and not wake up. That would be ideal, but they didn't, I mean, they died sinking into Lake Superior, uh, which to me, it, could, could, it couldn't be more frightening. Look, when we talked about Dennis Hale there, and he actually died and got on the ship, and was meeting his shipmates, went back to the stern, and that guy, and one guy comes out and says, Dennis, what are you doing here? It's not your time. And poof, just like that, he was back on that raft, and it wasn't two minutes later, here comes a Coast Guard helicopter, and, and rescues him. Unfortunately, the other guys on the raft didn't make it, you know, so. Uh, Lifeboats are useless, okay? Let's change that. So let, let's let's make this safer, you know? But they've got the global positioning system. They got, they got what's that called? Where They know where every ship is on the Great Lakes. And if there's an emergency, boom, they're on it right now. That is a pretty good thing. That's a real good thing, as a matter of fact. Not so, so in 1975. Yeah, well, we've made real good progress in a lot of things, but in other areas, we've taken gigantic leaps backwards and... Uh, I'm not going to get into it, but the politics of this country is screwing things up so much it's ridiculous, you know. The, this country is the greatest country in the world, it always has been. Had it not been for the United States, we'd all be speaking uh, uh, German right now uh, and Japanese. You know, we're the ones that saved England's butt and stopped Hitler. We're the ones that stopped the Japanese. They're, they're decimating our military, for God's sakes, with this woke generation stuff. Nah, this is ridiculous. It's just, just ridiculous. Crime is running rampant all over the place. Scary. Say yeah. it again. Dudley Paquette. Paquette, Paquette. Like he said, earlier in his career, the ships were smaller and they couldn't go as fast. But the Fitzgerald was fast and bam, 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 bam. And he was, you know as well as I do, something's going to wear out here real quick. You keep doing this. But the older ships would last longer because they were going slower. And, her, and the riveted ships, the Sykes, the Anderson, riveted ships. And, uh, oh, one last thing I got to tell you. This is it. It just popped in my brain. The was plated together, not by rivets. Welded. 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 Yeah, Welded. yeah. The head of the National Transportation Board told Bethlehem Steel, I want to ride on that Arthur B. Homer and see for myself what's going on. This because it was sister ship of the sister, sister ship right? Sister ship yep. Bethlehem Steel told him, go pound sand, pal. You ain't getting on this boat. They laid her up. And I never ran again, and they sold it for scrap. So this is after spending millions lengthening this thing. Bethlehem knew that Arthur B. Homer was just exactly like the Fitzgerald. Big time problems. But you don't tell the National Transportation Safety Board, the head of that, no, you can't come on here. But they did, and he didn't. And uh, Arthur B. Homer was history. They oh. found a bunch of cracks in her, and uh, there's... That's why it's so important if we could find some people who work, work on our fits, you know. And, well, I remember this or I remember that, you know. Yeah, they're getting yeah. older now, they wouldn't be afraid to tell you this stuff, see. I mean, we're about nearly 50 years away from it. We're, uh, the people that were on it are going to become few and far between. It's yeah. like losing a World War II soldier, you know. I'll be another we're month gone. older here next, mo or next month. Yeah, and uh, the rest of us too. I'm still able to walk and talk, and I hope I can keep doing that for a while.